Hello everybody, Robert Rambles here, and thank you so much for joining me today. This is going to be the first video in a series of videos where we talk about the beginnings of your WoW Classic journey. This video is going to cover character creation, as well as your first steps into the world of Azeroth as a fledgling adventurer. The video is intended for anyone new to the game, or even anyone coming back to Classic from modern World of Warcraft. Now, if you're like most people and you're coming from any sort of modern gaming, then there's something you might not be thinking about as you log into WoW Classic for the first time. And that is that 95% of all the significant and impactful choices that you're going to be able to make in Classic are going to happen during character creation. You see, in WoW Classic, you won't be making choices while you quest and play the game that are going to affect the plot of each zone or the story of the overall game in any way. You won't be joining any sub-factions, unless we're talking about just grinding reputation. And let's face it, every single boss that you slay is simply going to respawn moments later for the next hero to do the same. You won't be choosing from a pool of companion characters and developing their skills or personalities, and you won't have any sort of player housing. Oh, and you won't even have access to a barbershop to change anything about your character's general appearance. With that being said, it's definitely not a bad thing if a significant portion of your first hour with WoW Classic is spent on the character creation screen. These choices are going to affect the rest of your time with the game in critical ways, and depending on the amount of time and the willingness you have to experiment with different races and classes, these choices could lead you to not enjoying your time with the game before your true journey has even begun. Let's talk through some of the choices that you'll make, and a few ways each will impact your gameplay experience. The first choice you have to make is choosing your faction in a world that has nearly always been at war. Will you join the races of the Horde? Four races comprise the Horde. The Brutal Orcs, the Shadowy Undead, the Spiritual Tauren, and the Quick-Witted Trolls. Beset by enemies on all sides, these outcasts have forged a union they hope will ensure their mutual survival. Or will you choose the Alliance? The Alliance consists of four races the Noble Humans, the Adventurous Dwarves, the Enigmatic Night Elves, and the Ingenious Gnomes. Bound by a loathing for all things demonic, they fight to restore order in this war-torn world. Something to keep at the forefront of your mind is that the overarching narrative for much of the game can said to be based mainly on your faction choice, alliance, or horde. And to some degree, the moral integrity of your character is tied to that choice as well. This is because your faction decides, among many other things, which quest you're going to have access to in each zone, and the content and tone of those quests varies greatly between the Alliance and the Horde. Very basically, if you want to be a generally good character and doing quests that are generally good intentioned, like healing injured soldiers or murdering kobolds by the scores because, well, they're rat people, then choose the Alliance. If you feel more comfortable in a neutral, morally gray, or downright chaotic evil type of hero, or anti-hero, choose the Horde, where you'll likely spend a ton of time developing new plagues and slaughtering humans, because it's World of Warcraft, not World of Sleepy Peacetown. Once the choice of faction is made, you can start looking at the races themselves. WoW Classic has eight races to offer, both with male and female models, some of which, like the Trolls and the Orcs, have a completely different silhouette than their male or female counterparts. Obviously the biggest thing that your race is going to determine will be the silhouette, the shape and visual appearance that you'll be staring at for hopefully hundreds of hours. In my own experience, one of my first characters in vanilla was a troll hunter, and it took me about 60 hours to just accept how much I hated the male troll's bent posture, and nearly gave my own back sympathy pains. After that, I went with a Tauren warrior, and he and I made it to level 60 together. Regardless of lore or how well a race may mesh with your chosen class, be absolutely sure that you make a character that you want to look at for hundreds of hours. One that helps you get immersed in the fantasy and the world of Azeroth. Moving from the aesthetic of your character to the aesthetic of the game world itself, your race choice will also determine what starting zone your journey will launch from. There are three starting zones per faction, so six in total, Two races on each faction will share a starting zone. Each zone has a very different look and overall vibe, and the quests and creatures found in each zone are equally as varied. Humans start in the idyllic but troubled Elwian Forest. Relatively safe due to its proximity to Stormwind City, Elwian Forest still faces troubles in the form of an infestation 
an invasion of kobolds, murlocs, and the thieving and scheming Defias Brotherhood. Because of the recent Trog invasion in their capital city of Nomergon, both gnomes and dwarves start off in the snowy hills of Dunmoro, in the shadow of the imposing mountain fortress which is Ironforge City. Dunmoro is a land that is troubled by both gnoll and troll incursions. Beginning Night Elf characters will find themselves in a dense living forest, which is actually the roof of a new world tree, Teldrassil, and home of the Night Elf capital city of Darnassus. Here, players will find a mysterious taint of shadow upon this otherwise pure and beautiful land. Over on the Horde side, the orcs and trolls both begin their journey in the rocky waste of Durotar, far to the south of the orc capital city of Orgrimmar, where a demonic cult may be lurking in the crags and caves of this desert zone. As a Forsaken, you'll begin your unlife in the fields of Tirasfall Glades, beyond the ruins of Old Lordaeron, which has since become the undead's very own Undercity. Tirasfall Glades is still a land overrun with the mindless undead scourge, as well as an infringing army of human scarlet crusade bent on the eradication of all undead, including you. And the Tauren begin their questing in the serene hills of Mulgor, a beautiful and peaceful land in the shadow of their towering plateau city of Thunder Bluff. However, Mulgar is faced with an infestation of devastating Quilbor and imbalances in the land in Mother Nature. These initial starting zones, as varied as they are, do eventually open up to more possibilities as to where your adventures should take you. On the gameplay side of things, before we dig into classes, we need to talk briefly about racial abilities. Each race has access to its own special abilities. These abilities, whether they are active abilities you'll use, or boost to stats that happen passively, may synergize better or worse with certain classes. And before we start talking about the game's classes and gameplay styles, it's important to note that while the racial abilities can be very useful, you shouldn't make the mistake of letting a racial ability and synergy with a certain class determine your race choice. Create a character that you love. Having a bit more intellect because you won't chose a gnome mage, or a bit more stamina as a tauren warrior, won't end up being a good thing if you don't like those races, how they look, and you don't identify with their lore. Now we can really talk about classes. This can be considered to be the meat and potatoes, since it is the class that's going to determine how all of your gameplay feels. Will you be at range, hurling massive spells, or firing precise barrages of arrows? Or will you thrive in melee, cleaving with a two-handed axe, or appearing from the shadows to attack with twin daggers? To me, the first and most important question you should ask yourself when picking your class is, do you want to be up close and personal with enemies 90% of the time, able to charge in, getting the most out of those incredibly detailed character models? Or, do you want to keep at a safe distance, preferring to take down your targets before they land much, if any, damage on you? After you've decided if you're more comfortable in melee or at range, you'll need to think about what role you might want to fill in a group. Whether that be in open world content or in five-man dungeons or during endgame raiding. For most group roles in WoW Classic, you'll usually be a tank, a damage dealer, or a healer. Many classes, depending on how you choose to be specialized, can fill multiple roles. Do you want to hold the attention of enemies and take the brunt of their attacks while your friends take them down and keep you alive? Or do you want to be the one dishing out the damage? Or is supporting your fellow adventurers with healing spells and buffs more your preference? Let's take a look at each class now, and we'll talk a bit about the playstyles of each, and the group roles that they can fill. Warriors train constantly and strive for perfection in armed combat. Though they come from all walks of life, they are united by their singular commitment to engage in glorious battle. Many warriors serve as mercenary soldiers, while others become adventurers and danger-seeking fortune hunters. A typical warrior is strong, tough, and exceptionally violent. A warrior will always be in melee. As a warrior, you can deal damage using massive, two-handed weapons, or by dual-wielding one-headed weapons and striking viciously and quickly. The warrior wielding a sword and shield will often be looked at to tank, and take the lead in dangerous encounters while in a group. Warriors use rage as their resource which builds up when you take or deal damage, but drains when you're out of combat. As a warrior, you'll start off equipping chain armor, and eventually, at level 40, you'll unlock the ability to wear the heaviest armor, plate. 
Rogues are most successful when their deeds never come to light. Fond of poisons and silent projectile weapons, rogues rely on a blend of stealth and minor mysticism. Usually in the employ of rich nobles or local governments, the rogue redistributes wealth or eliminates designated targets. A rogue's allegiance lasts only as long as the latest contract. A rogue will employ poisons and stealth, followed by quick barrages of relentless attacks, usually dual-wielding daggers, swords, or maces. They use focus, which is a resource that regenerates automatically over time, and rather quickly. And they build combo points on targets to use on big finishing moves. As a rogue, you'll start off wearing leather armor, and you'll always wear leather armor throughout the course of the game. Paladins do battle to protect the world from the forces of shadow. Powerful warriors in their own right, they can also call upon the light to heal wounds, create shields of force, and incinerate evil creatures. Although paladins were once exclusively human, a number of stout-hearted dwarves have recently been welcomed into the Order of the Silver Hand. The paladin can wield two-handed maces and swords, and focus on physical and holy magic damage dealing abilities. By casting and judging seals upon your enemies, you'll damage and weaken your foes. Paladins can also equip a sword and shield and act as a tank, holding the attention of enemies and mitigating damage. They can also cast healing spells on themselves and groupmates, and cleanse negative effects. The paladin can, to some degree or another, act as a tank, a damage dealer, or a healer. Druids live in a state of unparalleled union with nature. Tightly bound to the plant and animal kingdoms, they are natural shapeshifters, and so they know firsthand the abuse visited on their wild brethren. In consequence, despite their numbers, druids tend to be wary, reclusive, and difficult to spot. Few outsiders have plumbed the depths of their secrets. The druid is a class with many forms, all their magic based deeply in nature. You can deal melee damage shapeshifted into a cat, or tank enemies as a bear. If you want to be a ranged caster, then you also have a moonkin form which can sling solar and lunar based nature spells from ranged. And if healing is what you're after, they have a nature based healing spells with a focus on healing over time. The druid relies on mana while casting or healing. It relies on focus while in cat form and on rage as a resource while in bear form. A truly versatile class for the player who wants to have access to all the playstyles. Shaman commune directly with the elements. Their combination of wisdom and resilience makes them ideal as tribal advisors and leaders. In battle, the shaman used totems and spells to manipulate the elements and provoke other fighters to untold heights of rage and might. Shaman exemplify the primal bond between the savage races and their environment. Shaman is another hybrid class rooted in nature. They utilize totems to provide buffs, healing, and damage, and rely on a combination of nature spells and physical attacks for their direct damage. They also have the ability to heal. Shaman can equip one or two-handed maces and axes, and they also have the ability to equip shields, though it should be said they don't make the best tanks. As a shaman, you can choose to focus on dealing damage from ranged, or you can set up your character to be more of a melee damage dealer. They rely on mana for all their abilities, and at first you'll be wearing leather, but you can wear chain armor at level 40. Magi are wizards of immense knowledge and skill. Their obvious physical frailty is deceptive, for they can call upon cosmic energies of the twisting nether. Rarely do magi engage in melee combat, instead they prefer to attack from a distance hurling powerful bolts of frost and flame at their unsuspecting enemies. The mage brings destruction to bear on their enemies from range with devastating fire and crippling ice spells. They also have access to the purely destructive arcane energy spells. As a mage, you can have these three choices to focus on, either fire, ice, or arcane, each powerful in its own right and in its own situation. The mage also has a large toolkit of utility spells, offering crowd control and damage mitigation. Mana is their resource, and as a mage, you will only ever wear cloth armor. Warlocks are the bane of all life. Empowered by demonic blood, they can inflict great torment upon their foes. To replenish the dreadful energy their spells expend, warlocks drain vitality from their victims. The warlock can also summon and control terrifying demonic entities. Still, warlocks are feared above all else for their singular wickedness and cruelty. As a warlock, you can summon a demon companion. You gain access to summon more demons with varied specialties and abilities over time as you level up. As a warlock, you'll have access to demonic and shadow spells, among them a variety of damage over time abilities and leeching abilities designed to steal your target's health or mana. Most warlocks will focus 
more on stacking damage over time spells on their targets, whereas a mage focuses more on direct damage spells. Warlocks will also use mana as a resource, and just like mages, they'll only ever wear cloth armor. Hunters know the uncharted places of the world. Gifted with a deep empathy for all life, they have an uncanny knack for befriending wild animals and taming them as pets. In addition, hunters can use their finely honed senses to become master trackers. Wherever hunters go, they fight back the ravages of sickness, exploitation, and industrialization. Hunters are a pet class, and eventually you gain the ability to tame pets of your own choosing. Different types of pets will have different abilities and fill different roles for a hunter. Aside from their pet, hunters deal ranged damage with bows, crossbows, or guns, and need to carry the appropriate ammo for each unless you want to be forced into melee combat, where hunters are substantially weaker. Hunters will also need to be mindful of their pet's happiness levels in Classic WoW, and feed their pet regularly, unless you want to be abandoned in the middle of a critical battle. Hunters use mana as their resource, and as a hunter, you'll begin wearing leather armor, but can upgrade to wear chain armor at level 40. Priests guide the spiritual destiny of their people. Through their unique insight into the mind, they are able to shape an individual's beliefs, whether to inspire or terrify, soothe or dominate, heal or harm. Just as the heart can hold both darkness and light, priests wield powers of creation and devastation by channeling the potent forces underlying faith. The priest leverages holy spells to both heal and harm, but they also have access to shadow magic, and can be designed to heal using holy spells and barriers, or to deal damage using a combination of holy and shadow magic. The priest's ability to cast barriers and heals gives them a lot of survivability while playing solo, and a ton of utility if in a group. Priests will wear cloth armor for the entirety of the game, and their resource is mana. Something to keep in mind when choosing your class is that not all classes and certainly not all specializations in WoW Classic are created equally, not even close. The amount of balancing, rebalancing of classes that we've seen in modern WoW over the years simply hadn't happened yet. Basically, the classes had yet to be homogenized or pruned. Unfortunately, when it comes to filling roles in a group at endgame content, there are very clearly classes that will do better as say a tank or a healer than others. This is important if you're one of those individuals who really wants to maximize your character and their performance in endgame group content. For everyone else just looking to enjoy as much as the game as they can, make friends along the way and have fun, I would definitely say, just like choosing a race, choose a class that you love the feel and aesthetic of, not the class that you think will get you into an elite 40 man raiding guild at endgame, unless of course that's your expressed goal when it comes to playing WoW Classic. Ultimately, and especially in 2020, I feel like if you pick a class that you love, you'll just be more dedicated to learning the ins and outs of that class, improving your skill and gear set and specialization over time, and just having more fun with the game and being able to engage with it on a deeper level. And if that's the case, you'll find a place in endgame content regardless of your class, if that's a goal that you have. And now, with your WoW character fully created, you're ready to venture into the enormous world of Azeroth, and begin your hero's journey from humble beginnings. As you enter your starting area for the first time, I hope that you find yourself excited, and I hope that you're surrounded by fellow adventurers who are just getting their feet under them and are as excited as you are. In the next video, we'll cover what your level 1 to 10 experience is like and the things that you should prioritize during levels 1 to 10. If you liked today's video, please give it a like and think about subscribing if you want to see more WoW content and ringing the bell. Thank you so much for joining me today. Your support, it really means a lot to me. So I hope you take care of yourselves out there, and that we'll see you again really soon. Bye now.